Uh, doing his first act with the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bill in the chair. You know. um, music, musical. Uh, in the early part of the 19th century, um, big pubs would have a, a music room and uh, they used to have things called free and easies where anybody could get up and sing and perform or whatever. Well, along came the Industrial Revolution, and these places weren't big enough uh, to satisfy the entertainment needs of the working classes specifically. Um, so they moved into bigger premises. Um, some of these posts were knocked down or made bigger or whatever. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Who's done that? Um, and the sort of the emphasis was as much on food and drink as it was on uh, entertainment, really. So you can imagine uh, you're in a great big hall with waiters and people serving drinks all the time, and people trying to perform on stage. Um, also, it was a place to smoke, so you would have the smell of food, smoke, people getting drunk, and somebody trying to. Uh, do their acts on stage, which has been quite uh, daunting. Um, the current act, actors would be defeated without any microphones and all the rest of it. So there you go. It's a, it was a, quite a tough time. Uh, but they started to grow from the 1850s onwards. Um, they were, of course, uh, looked down by the middle classes. The, this was not theatre. This was purely... Uh, entertainment for the white polloi um, and uh, <laughs> even so there was a certain sort of class distinction in these places because uh, the people who could afford to eat and drink would be downstairs in the saloon and those with less money who just wanted to hear the entertainment would be up in the, the gallery so uh, so um, eventually, um, it became big business, not so much for the participants, but for the management. There were lots of um, groups of managers who controlled big theatres and stuff. So, um, so they just shows you this kind of thing that would be. Uh, <laughs> and you would get variety acts, you know, kind of like. Um, it's interesting how the standards of beauty change. Kind of... <laughs> There's hope for me, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> this, what uh... a dirty laugh, God! <laughs> <laughs> That's a great comment. Um, <laughs> I mean, this lady here with the built-in bustle, um, presumably it was a strong, a strong woman act. I don't really know, but. Uh, they don't look real, these things. I mean, they must have been very happy, but they look like they're made out of plastic or something, but they probably weren't. But anyway, they so you get uh, comedians. Um, the, the, the women have complained that, well, people have complained that women, that people don't find women funny, but I think in those days there were an awful lot of um, comedians appearing in musical, perhaps more about comic songs than actually telling jokes but uh, there you go and there's a lot of cross-dressing um, male to female female to male um perhaps you know sort of, I, I don't know i don't know whether it was anything to do with sexuality i think it was just just this i think this here in the corner is vesta tilly who is probably one of the famous um female impersonators or male impersonators, I should say. And this lady's, I don't know, she's playing a ukulele in a very dangerous looking position to me, but there you go, it's, uh, um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was all. And perhaps in amongst all of that, you would get it, the central picture at the bottom, somebody reciting a bit of poetry or Shakespeare or whatever, you know, kind of, everything was thrown in. Um, this guy, uh, Little Titch, um, was only four feet six inches tall. 
uh, and his shoes were two foot three inches long. So, uh, and he, he apparently he used to do this amazing dance. Um, and he, he, he would even stand on tiptoe with, with these shoes on. Um, somebody else used to do that. Was it Billy Dainty or somebody like that? I think Did probably he was a sort of. I think I've seen that. Yeah, like so a tri like tribute that. act to Little Titch. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, Little Titch was around from 1887 to 1928. Uh, he made he made a fortune. He made uh, he made lots and lots of money. But on but like a lot of uh, the, these entertainers, uh, drink got in the way of things. So it was quite often. Uh, but uh, uh, he was one of the few people that the, the music hall in the UK didn't translate abroad terribly well. Uh, even people like Dan Lino, who went to America, didn't go down very well because the, the humour was different. So they kind of didn't get some of the jokes. This guy was apparently very successful all over Europe because his act was more visual than spoken. So that he was. Apparently, he was very funny. Uh, he wasn't just this; it wasn't his only act. He used to, he used to do all kinds of other things. But he, uh, his final farewell was he was uh, dressed as a, a Cockney charwoman with a mop and a bucket. And uh, one night, he got caught with the mop handle, hit him on the head. Uh, it's part of it, and he carried on. But in fact, it brought on a stroke, and he died um, a few weeks later, aged only about forty-two or something. Anyway, that's a little touch. And here are two beauties from the. Uh, um, I, I'm not quite sure who who these ladies were or what they did, but the um, what we, I don't know. Maybe it was a a double act of some kind. <laughs> um, but maybe they sang, maybe they told, I don't know, but they, they were kind of like, they, I just like the image of these two Victorian women. They um, look like wrestlers. Sorry? They do look Perhaps like they wrestlers. Were wrestlers or something. Yeah, yeah Female well lady wrestlers. <laughs> or maybe a, a strong person, you know, yeah. do something acrobatic. I don't really know, but I just like the image of the fact that, uh, and, and this sort of, um, very stylized photograph of these two women, you know, it's kind of totally unnatural, isn't it, really, that they're posing for photographs. But then in those days, it took a long time to get your photograph taken, didn't it? With the man behind the black <laughs> And their waves in their hair, the Marcel waves, aren't they, with yeah. the dip with irons. And yeah. clearly, clearly, the background is a, a theatre backdrop, isn't it? So it's sort of, anyway, there you go. And then... You may remember these three, and uh, they survived onto into the 1950s and 60s on television. Um, they used to do the sun dance in the desert. <laughs> so there's Wilson, Keppel, and Betty. I think Betty changed quite a lot over the years. I think there was a new Betty brought in every so often, but Wilson and Keppel managed to keep going well into the well, old age. Uh, I think you can probably find uh, YouTube versions of them. Yeah, there are lots of them, yeah. Mm. Um, but they, they, I remember them on telly in the early 60s anyway, mostly. And then, you know, my uncle used to do impersonations of them when he'd had a few drinks. So it's quite, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Quite funny, really. But there you go. Uh, yeah. Do you think they'll be done for cultural appropriation nowadays? Uh -huh. Uh, well, I think it's very kind of non-PC, isn't it, really? But it's, <laughs> I think much of it was, but then these were the times that they were. But, uh, uh, in America, it was called vaudeville, which is much the same kind of thing, but obviously um, wasn't much crossover between the two. Um, um, so this is, to some extent, what the music hall would have looked like for a big crush of people around the bar, people, you know, in, in different parts of the music hall itself. Um, definitely entertainment rather than high culture or whatever. But, uh, there you go. Uh, the, the, f 
first sort of uh, popular musical was, I think it was called The Canterbury in Lambeth. Um, does that say Canterbury at the top? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and it, it held 2,000 people. So imagine how mm -hmm. probably on different levels in all the West So you would be down below, you'd have the restaurant part with the theatre, and then you'd have the different levels of people paying uh, or right up to the gallery. Yeah. And, the cheapest seats. Quite, quite a challenge, I think, to perform in somewhere like that. And here is yeah, Mary Mary Lloyd, is it? Yeah. Mary Lloyd. Yeah. Incredibly prominent teeth. She was very popular and she made lots of money. Uh, she was around from she was born in 1870 and she died in 1922, so she was only 52 when she died. Um, but she was um probably the most famous of, of, of the musical singers. Um, subject to, she had poor choices of men. She was a bit battered wife and all the rest of it. And she was used and abused by managers and all the rest of it. So um, she didn't die penniless, but uh, a lot of her money was um, taken by, taken away by men. Who, but uh, there are, uh, I was trying to play a recording of her singing a little what you fancy does you good, but it must have been made when she was older, because, but uh, nevertheless, uh, she's one of the icons of the musical. And here is, who's this, Gordon? Dan Leno. Dan Leno, Dan where's he from? Yeah. He's, well, he visited Rochdale. Well, he was born in Rochdale. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he made, he was around 1860 to 1904, so he was only 44 when he died. He died, he died in 1904 and he left £11,000. So I don't know what that was worth, but I would imagine that was quite a... Quite a married Lydia, he married yeah. Lydia Reynolds from Beswick Street, just down the road from here. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Oh. <laughs> I like it. He actually, got, he actually got married in Hume in Manchester. The, the, I don't know where he's. He married he's Lydia. He met her when he was 17, uh, when she was 17, sorry. And they had six kids. Sorry, go on. One of the great musical comedians. But his life was uh, fairly short, I guess. Uh, and this, this one is um, the gentleman I'm looking at here is George Labour one who was uh, one of the great musical performers. He was the famous Champagne Charlie. Um, but, uh, uh, and he was like, you know, it, I think they used to call them, they were like pretend upper class people. So they'd become on dressed in top part and tails and all the rest of it. And, 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 uh, um, is that like Burlington Bertie or is it? No, this one is Burlington oh, Bertie. Sorry. This is a That's female, early. this is Vesta Tilly, yeah. um, who was uh, one of the famous uh, female impersonators. I keep saying female, I mean male impersonators, but uh, a female impersonating a male, yeah. Um, and uh, she uh, lived until 1952. She was born in 1864, so she must have been... 38, which is quite a good age. Uh, this is how she looks sometimes. She sometimes appears as a woman as well, so quite attractive. So, Did you go? Yeah, same thing. And she left 85 grand in 1952, which I've worked out was well over 3 million quid, so she she done good, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> well, he stayed sober. Yeah, well, I think she had a happy marriage and family life as well. So it was kind of like, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, it sort yeah. of pans out that way, doesn't it? I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And then in 1907, uh, there was a, a music hall war, as they called it. Mm. So they all they all went on strike because um, this time, of course, the, the early days of unions and all the rest of it, but. Um, for two weeks, they uh, all, all the artists and stagehands and stage a strike uh, against theatre managers and the kind of restrictive practices and all the rest of it. 
Uh, it, it lasted for two weeks. And what they wanted was a, a minimum wage uh, and uh, a maximum working week for musicians. So, um, and if effectively they, they got their demands. So uh, it was actually a successful strike uh, on like what's going on today, because presumably there was some yeah, negotiations uh, going on, but... Uh, Where's Derek when we need him? Sorry? <laughs> I said, where's, <laughs> where's Derek when we need him? In, 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 <laughs> there you go. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I, I think in many cases, pay was very poor, uh, and, uh, you know, people would struggle to... to keep body and soul together. So this was um, a successful uh, event. Also, of course, um, Musicians Union is still going strong now. I think it's, it's quite a powerful sort of thing. So um, there you go, 1907. Uh, and this is a kind of alphabetical joke. Uh, all the things that were A stands for agents who grind down the pro, B stands for bullies who ever write, et cetera. So, uh, sees their commission on a certain percent. And so it, it, it just lists all the things that they were, you know, uh, fighting against. And as I said before, there were two or three, um, I think, stole theatres and moss theatres, um, controlled theatres around the country, so that if you were under contract to one of them, you couldn't appear in the other, uh, you know, if, you, if you're under contract to stall, you couldn't appear in moss theatres. So, so I think they kind of broke that sort of uh, idea. Okay, it's a long way to Tipperary. Um, yeah, Staley Bridge man. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, probably uh, the First World War was the high point of the musical in terms of power and success, uh, and they were shameless in recruiting. Um, people actually in the theatre, so they would have people, you know, from the army there saying, come on lads, you know, do your bit and all the rest of it. Um, so, uh, eventually, of course, when people realise what the war was about, okay, there's, there's some famous musical songs here. Uh, most of them you may, well, some of them you'll recognise them. Champagne Charlie, My Old Man, Knocked them in the old Kent Road, etc., etc. Uh, isn't it funny was, that we? Isn't it funny that we still know them all? Yes, uh, they, yes. They, they, they've survived, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. Uh, I I was surprised to see Daddy wouldn't buy me a Bow Wow as a musical song. I thought that was the nineteen fifties. You know, yeah. Uh, but yeah. apparently, and so they just kept reviving them. Uh, yeah. Oh, Mister Paul, oh, Nelly Dean, Nelly Dean, my goodness. Uh, mm. Lily of Laguna was my grand's favourite. Um, <laughs> she used to sing it. My grandma used to sing all these at the piano. I can remember standing listening when I was just tiny. Yeah. Um, they stay in your head, don't they? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wonder how much longer they will survive, though. I mean, I don't know whether they're, you know, younger generations, younger than us anyway, I'm familiar with them, I don't know. But then there were the World War I patriotic songs, keep the home fires burning and pack up your troubles and all that stuff. And then as the war moved on, things got a little more satirical. You know? What did you do in the Great War, Daddy, which was aimed at profiteers and slackers? And, and, and um, Mr. Tilly was used to sing this thing. I've got a bit of a blighty one, show. A soldier delighted to have a wound that would send him home. So he wasn't killed, but he was, you know, sent home because of his wounds. Um, don't know if anybody remembers in Downton Abbey, but the um, one of the valets who was sent to the First World War got himself injured by putting his finger up and getting and being sent home. But there you go. There was a you know, the chocolate. This was G.H. Elliott, who also came from Rochdale, kind of Gordon, yeah. Um, oh, wonderful place. Yeah, indeed, the birthplace <laughs> of music. Um, Amazing. And he was called the uh, chocolate coloured coon. Uh, yes, yeah. Which, uh, all the, this uh, makeup was from burnt cork. But 
shamelessly advertising fries chocolate there. I, I find that quite creepy, actually, but there you go. It's sort of, it, it was of its time, I suppose. Mm. Um, you know, and, uh, and he lived until 1962, actually, but uh, um, I can't tell you how much money he left him to break, but there you go. Uh, but, uh, I think he, 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 I remember him vaguely as a very old man popping up on, you know, variety programs on television that he used to have in the 50s and 60s. Um, terrible things like Sunday night at the London Palladium and, <laughs> uh, with people on motorcycles and people throwing things at each other and juggling and what have you. But uh, there you go. That, that was G.H. Elliott. So he had quite a successful career as... And of course, there were all those um, minstrel shows, which lasted until our our youth, anyway. You know, on television, mm -hmm. the shameful black and white minstrel show, which now yeah, it's actually like that. Fine, but uh, in fact, mm -hmm. was extremely popular in those. You know, there you go. Um, okay, what would the music hall be without the chairman? Um, mm -hmm. This is this was a famous one, Mr. Fox. Um, who used to control the audience uh, so that there was, um, and he would, you know, illiterate, illiterate to the literate only, um, introduce people onto the stage uh, and, and, and keep the noise down. And, you know, if there's any drunks in it, he had his gavel and he'd keep them quiet. Uh, and uh, your own, your very own, and then on would come the so yeah, so uh, a famous uh, once described Mary Lloyd as tasty, trippy, twiggy, timey, telling, tender, tempting, toothsome, transcendent, transcendent, trim, tactical, twinkling, tricksy, triumphant, tantalizing. Try remembering that. Um, it must have been uh, quite something. Yeah. And if you remember Leonard Sachs on the good old days on telly in the 50s to the 80s, he used to do all that stuff. But, uh, there you go. Um, I like the way he says um, toothsome. Toothsome, yeah, certainly. <laughs> Very appealing, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, at the end of the First World War, well, during the First World War, licensing laws had changed um, so that they became much stricter and that uh, there was much more control of, uh, um, you know, how, how often you could open for, to, to sell alcohol. And also, the musicals uh, had to move the bars away from the theatre into the side rooms. So, um, effectively, musical as such died and became variety, which was a sort of continuation of the similar thing, except it was much more respectable, much more controlled, much less reliant on food and drink and all that stuff. And of course, uh, it was also the jazz age, so people were, the young people anyway, were more interested in um, jazz and dancing, this, this kind of thing. And, and of course, in 1922, I think it was, um, the radio, the radio became a, a real competitor for entertainment, you know, for the music. Um, Fantastic photo. It is, isn't it? Um, it's kind of a bit, it's rather complicated looking radio to me, but there you go, and then these sort of the uh, outright, well, I don't know, yeah, yeah, black and white photographs always fascinate me. Um, mm. I always think they tell you a lot more than colour photographs. What, what's she holding, the woman on the right? Is it a dog? Know. It's a monkey, it's an animal. animal. It's one, no, it's one of those monkeys, you know, you see them, some of with them a, are with a drum, with a drum. With a drum. I don't know whether he has, but if you look at his face and the little hat on his head yeah, and his right. little yeah. red coat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very red. Well, you used to get you used to get made tin ones, didn't you? With the, 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 yes. The, um, yeah, it's one of those. Thank so you, she sir. looks a bit she looks a bit old to be carrying a soft toy, actually, but maybe she's holding it for the daughter, I don't know. Well, they look like young girls to me. They look like mm. young modern girls. They're yeah. Very modern looking. Just looking at I love them. their hair. Their hairstyles are gorgeous. Yeah. Marcel waves again. 
Who's Marcel? Got a lot to answer for that, Marcel, wasn't it? There you go. It's a song, isn't it? Marcel waving your hand. Sorry. I don't know if anyone remembers the film The Entertainer, but it was what from a John Osborne play. It was originally a play, and it was pretty much about the very last days of variety, about run-down theatres, you know, people struggling to make a living. Um, second, second rate act as well, I suppose. But uh, and th there is a scene in in the film where uh, true personality of the entertainer comes. Honestly, maybe it was fabulous in that actually. But uh, but there you go. Uh, um, and then the variety acts continue. We used to get them on telly in the fifties and the sixties when when I was a kid. Anyway, we used to we used to sit through them and relentlessly, but. Uh, that the eventually they stopped being and then of course television itself was another killer for the, the musicals and variety that people had them, uh, already had them in their own homes and, uh, and of course if you were a comedian or something you appear on television once you told a joke millions of people had heard it so you couldn't drag it around keep repeating it you had to have like new material all the time so. mm. um this is a <clears throat> This is a Barnborough's musical in Newcastle, which is still surviving, uh, which double does musical nights. Uh, it's a beautiful place, actually. It's quite it's quite small and compact, but it's, uh, it's right in the city centre. Um, but they, they have uh, regular musical type nights. And, um, Settle has the oldest surviving musical in the country, which is still operating. Um, Looks quite art deco. Um, I think it's more art nouveau, I would say, than art deco. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if it's from the late, you know, the arts and crafts period of the late 19th century. Um, this is the Ardwick Empire, which was a number one uh, theatre on the circuit. Um, there would be various classes of uh, music halls, but if you wanted to see the very top stars, you'd have to go to number one. The Ardwick Empire um, was on the corner of uh, Hyde Road and Ardwick Green opposite uh, the Apollo, on the opposite corner of the Apollo. Um, it was it was originally, well, it was called the Hippodrome. It was in later life, but it was built as the Ardwick Empire. Um, I remember going to see, to be to see Harry Seacombe there in Ompton. Humpty Dumpty in the early 1950s, but um, but it was pulled down in 68, and it's not really properly been, it's been an empty site pretty much ever since then. Uh, and then, of course, the Cars Theatre in Manchester was was one of the top touring uh, venues. Um, so you have, you know, the big names like Don Lino, Vesta Tilly, Harry mm. Taylor. Mm. Mm. Um, I think he was one of the, if not the highest paid man of his time. Don Lino. Yes, yeah. he, he, he made fortunes. He, he made, mm. uh, he, you know, he was earning a quarter of a million pounds a year in the 1910s or something. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I don't know if they've got any more to show you. Yeah, so eventually, um, Theatres closed or died out. Um, if you remember, the palace was closed for a long time before it, and the opera house were both closed um, until they were rescued and, and uh, re emerged in a different form. But uh, places like some of them were turned into bingo halls and strip clubs and the, the Hume Hippodrome, which I think still, still exists, or the building still exists anyway, uh, was at one time quite a you know, well known and notorious, infamous, whatever the word you like to use, strip club. Uh, but uh, a lot of them closed and died down. There's a, there's a theatre called the Victoria in Salford, just over there in, in near Cursor, which is still standing, but is in a very sad state of affairs. But to make sure you've got all these musical references correct. Yeah, so, oh, nice. Any old guy? Any old what? Iron. 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 Two Black lovely eyes. what? Two lovely Black eyes. eyes. 
Where did this man break the bank? Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. How many injuries were there? Eight. 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 I'm a right foul man named Henry. Henry, the eighth I am. What household plant grew to enormous portions of food? That's the biggest in the world. The biggest in the world. <laughs> what, Mrs. what was Mrs. Moore told not to do? Don't Go have on, any more. Don't no, have any more. Now, I don't know whether it was drink or children, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, right. And where did Billings... What time did Billings University get up and where was he from? 10.30. 10.30. Oh, it was 8.30. You got up at 10.30. 10.30. 10 10 where was it from? Oh. Burlington, Burlington. Oh. Burlington, oh. Burlington. Oh. Burlington. Burlington. Oh. And what was Harry Lauder's advice to travellers? I don't know. Mm. Uh, keep right on to the to end. end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Why wouldn't, couldn't Pastor Victoria's fiancé get to the church? Dilly and Dally. Because his, his wife wouldn't let him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was I waiting, waiting at the, the church. church. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what were Mary Lloyd's old man's instructions? Follow the van. Follow the van, that's it. We've never got so many in the quiz. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You'd actually probably get that done. How many evenings have we got left? <laughs> <laughs> Not many. Don't be pessimistic, Graham. <laughs> oh, I think that would be great fun if we had a musical. What about